Thank you, Katie. Would you join me in praying? Adonai tzifatai tiftach, ufi yagid tehilatecha. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. And Father, would you open our eyes, the spiritual eyes of our hearts, to see you more clearly and to receive the Father's love more deeply and to be transformed today for your glory and our good. We bless you. I ask these things in the name of Messiah Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, beloved Wheaton students, faculty, staff, and friends of the college, Disability Awareness Week has been designed to help us all grow by pressing deeper into God's heart and purpose for disability and people with disabilities. Now this passion of God's heart and purpose has marked me not only professionally, but also personally. I was hired here almost nine years ago to begin a special education program in the longstanding amazing Department of Education. And then more recently, the founding of the Center for Faith and Disability reflects a growing commitment in this institution to respond to God's prompting and leading to make this indispensable and yet often neglected dimension of his heart more visible. I also founded a nonprofit many years ago called Faith for All, designed to help faith communities become inclusive to respond to God's heart and purpose for disability. So I've been at this for a while, and you know, sometimes God uses interesting ways to get our attention, doesn't he? And uh, Jehovah Sneaky got my attention later in life as he put me on this path of addressing disability, uh, not only professionally, but he actually did what I like to call, gave me a professional development plan in my personal life. And so this issue has marked me personally as well. I have been blessed to become a father of five children. Five children who are fearfully and wonderfully made. My wife, bless her heart, uh, had four pregnancies. We have twins. You'll actually get to see them in a little bit here. But my wife and I have had multiple laps around the track of Neuropsych testing, genetic testing, behavior management, explorations, and the atypical wiring, dispositions, genetic makeup have marked my journey as a parent. And parenting, I think, brings out the best in you and the worst in you. You probably saw that in your parents. I like to say that when disability is in the mix, it makes, it just intensifies all of that a little bit. The lows can be lower, and the worst of me actually is pretty unavoidable. And in fact, I consider myself to have a fathering disability that I'm all too aware of every day where I imperfectly represent my perfect heavenly father on a daily basis that grieves my heart. Because my children are worthy of the fullness of the father's love. And I do the best I can. And I do some good stuff. But this, what I consider a a little bit tongue in cheek, but actually very sincere, a fathering disability makes me intimately aware of my shortcomings on a moment, on a daily basis. And you know what I've learned? Is that is a holy invitation to embrace the kind of weakness Sam testified to on Monday. 
to let the power and the strength of God and his love be perfected in me and displayed in me. So I want to quickly give a survey of John 9, very quickly a survey through John 9 to take us to three adjustments that we can make to gain sight for the blind. Because as I said, when disability impacts a family, the lows can be lower, but the highs can be higher. And I've marked my professional life on trying to invite others in to see and to savor the source of that goodness. So join me in running through a survey of John chapter 9. I'm going to go through the chapter quickly. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically there are these blinding characteristics. Different people, different people have been blinded in different ways. We start out with the verses that we read. The disciples, they came to Jesus with a question. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, neither. Reminds me of Joshua, doesn't it? In Joshua 5, 14. When Joshua, right before the conquest of Jericho, and he sees the angel of the army of the Lord, the, the host, the angel of hosts, and he says, are you for us or for our enemies? And a similar answer, neither. You came with the wrong question. Let me help you. The disciples here have the wrong question. So Jesus answers, actually, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed. So then Jesus heals the man. In the middle of this passage, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes and said, go and wash. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. And then the neighbors, well, the neighbors who had formerly seen him begging. They had some misconceptions, as the Pharisees will in a minute, but they went a little further in what blinded them. Some claimed that he was the blind man. Some claimed, no, we don't. He looks like him. And after a little bit of a scuffle, they bring in the Pharisees. And the Pharisees had some misconceptions about who the Messiah was supposed to be. But they went a little further in their blinding with offense. They were offended by Jesus. I wonder if you've ever been offended by the ways of God that you don't understand or that you don't like. I have. <laughs> These Pharisees say, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. They picked a religious practice that, that they assumed disqualified and delegitimized this man from being the Messiah. They were blinded by their offense by Jesus. This is part one. We'll get to another part in a minute. You can click for me. Maybe we can go to the next slide. The next, we go to the parents. Yeah, the parents. So we've got the disciples the neighbors, the Pharisees, and now the parents. And they were blinded by the fear of man. In verse 20, when they get called in, they say, we know he is our son, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age. He can speak for himself. And then we don't have to wonder what was going on because we're told. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be pit, put out of the synagogue. I can relate to that fear. And then the Pharisees come back for another round of offense. We know this man is not a sinner. And about Jesus at the end, they say, as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And then the blind man who has now been given spiritual uh, physical sight and spiritual sight actually testifies about who Jesus is. And you know what he gets? Welcomed and embraced and lauded and praised and accepted. No, he gets persecuted. He gets persecuted. Stings the flesh, but a sweetness underneath ready to be had, which the blind man does in a moment when Jesus finds him we like to think that seeing is believing, right? But in the economy of God, believing is seeing. 
when confronted with the messiahship of this man and asked the question, do you believe in him? He's basically like, show me. You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. With or without physical sight, a right relationship with the Messiah determines the lens through which we can see and savor or be blinded, misguided by our preconceptions, or offended by the ways of him who knows us best and loves us most and promises to work all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So in the chapter, we see the person with a disability is the one who sees clearly. The followers of Jesus were blinded by wrong questions. Do you have wrong questions that blind you from encountering, believing, and worshiping? The neighbor is blinded by their preconceptions. Do you have preconceptions? Are you blinded like the religious leaders were by their offense when things don't work out the way you want them to? Or like the parents blinded by fear of man when circumstances heat up and trials intensify, do you wither or do you get ready to roar like a lion? May God grant us faith to roar as he gives us a message to proclaim. And so Disability Awareness Week is about inviting us all to grow by pressing deeper into God's heart and purpose for people with disabilities and taking those things that have been outside of our field of vision and bringing them into the center to realize this indispensable yet often neglected aspect of God's heart and purpose can take its proper place in the kingdom community of believers. And so real quickly, three adjustments that we can make. And this is all going to be just a, kind of a teaser of some content. I'm going to go quickly and then give you a way to follow up. But the first adjustment to help us gain sight is going to be an attitude adjustment. We all need attitude adjustments. You heard about family retreats last time from uh, John Feligale or Johnny and Friends. Well, my wife and I had a deep experience with family retreat. This is from 2013. There was an article. There's me, and at that point, I only had four kids, but uh, the twins there, those are my twins, and my son was born with Down syndrome, which brought us into this world of disability, but as a dad, uh, my experience began to shift in shape. Uh, truth be told, when I told my wife I wanted to go to this family retreat, she said, no way, I don't want to go to that thing. We were parents of new, uh, new parents, experiencing new parenthood, multiples, and disability. It was uh, an introduction to parenthood with a bang. And my wife had no interest in going to this retreat. Uh, we finally ended up going, and by the end of the week, she had to be taken away kicking and screaming. And we went back every year after that for so many years. And what was so profound about it, and I actually uh, I think I wrote it in the middle, underneath the picture there, in, a, in the world, kids with disabilities are treated differently and excluded. It's painful. Family retreat comes along and knocks our socks off. Here, all our kids are loved with the love of God that doesn't depend on their ability or disability. And I gotta tell you, what marked me about family retreat, and I hope and pray that many of you will go and volunteer on a family retreat or take advantage of a host of other opportunities that we are trying to make accessible to you to have this impact of what marked me then years ago was this, I had twins. And it was the first experience where the presence of a disability didn't disenfranchise you, nor did it privilege you. Because his twin sister was equally loved on and equally had an experience. And I realized that there was a kingdom culture there where the presence or absence of a disability or ability was not the dominant factor in how we all related to each other. And it tasted like heaven on earth. And it marked me. And that's my hope and prayer for Wheaton College is that we would be that kind of community. So we need an adjustment in our attitudes. And... 
Some of you may have heard of the five stages of attitudes. This was coined by Dan Vanderplotz, a co-laboring attitude. Uh, but I'm going to move us forward in the interest of time to just give you a visual on some things that we are trying to build resources to help you adjust your attitudes to move from a place of ignorance and not just pity people, not just care for them, but enter into friendships and co-laboring where everybody has a gift and everybody is able to serve. But we also have to have an adjustment in our theology. I was challenged to rethink my worldview and my theology when I met Jesus at age 26. And that rethinking of a theology is fleshed out here in these 10 pillars of disability theology, which are on the center's website. You can download them and read them. These 10 pillars walk through a general theology of creation and fall or corruption and the promise of a Messiah, his coming the first time, and then his coming again. But what about in between that, where we need sight to see his working now in this broken age? And that's where the deeper disability theology comes in. John 9 gives us a window into the glory that God wants to use purposefully through his workings in and through people with disabilities. Whether they get physically healed or not, there's testimonies of weakness becoming a platform for strength to be revealed, and then love and unity being embodied by kingdom community, and then the Mount Everest of disability theology, which is suffering. Suffering. But that theology of disability is on the website. I encourage you to go under foundations. The last adjustment is about relationships. We have a lot on belonging that I'm not going to take the time to go through. But this, these are disability foundations. And I invite you to take some time this week to check out the website, wheaton.edu, Faith and Disability. And under the foundations tab, these attitudes, theology, and belonging dimensions of belonging can help us make these adjustments. And so I want to leave you, Wheaton College, with a charge to make faith-fueled adjustments in your attitudes and in your theology and ultimately in your relationships, the way you relate to yourself with the Father and his love through your relationship with Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to then be able to see more clearly other people around you who are hurting in invisible ways, and increasingly by the illumination of the Spirit of God, visible ways, and enter into those relationships to be able to see Jesus more clearly and embrace other image bearers more fully and to reflect his love, not only individually in our own lives, but corporately as a community here as we do life together in this broken age where we shouldn't be offended by the ways of God who is good and his love endures forever. So that's my charge. Will you receive it? And ask the Lord to help you make these adjustments that we could give glory and honor to him. And another opportunity that you will have as I pray and dismiss you, I want to highlight, you, highlight for you an opportunity tomorrow night from 6 to 9. Uh, you can come for any part of that if you want, but in Armadang 132 Recital Hall, we're going to have a movie night and show excerpts of Johnny Erickson Tata's story and we're going to have a panel and be able to show a few clips and talk about it. So if you want to think about these issues a little bit more, just come. We'll have some snacks, and we'll talk and deepen the dialogue. But may this week be a beginning and a tectonic plate shifting to help us be a community of belonging and flourishing for everyone, regardless of ability, that God's ability to transform those with physical, mental, developmental, genetic, behavioral, neurological, and every other human atypicality, it's not an impediment in the economy of God. It's an opportunity for God to magnify his glory and his goodness. And may we partner with him in that. So Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for your ways that are higher than our ways. And we pray a blessing upon this day, this week, and this community. May we reflect more and more of you and less and less of us. Prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.